everybody, we are live, and tonight is a very special night. Um, you will recognize the authors that are on screen with me, but I am still going to take my time, read their bios, and give you an introduction, because that's my job, and I love these <laughs> authors, and they're amazing. So you just have to listen to me. Now, in case you don't know, or in case you just want to hear me say their names, we are celebrating Adam Silvera tonight and Infinity Reaper. Big round of applause. It is book two. So this is the follow-up to Infinity Sun, which it is. Oh, did I freeze? Did I freeze? No, oh, you're, you're good. You're good. Oh, sweet. OK. Sorry, everyone, I froze earlier. But Infinity Sun is this amazing New York-based fantasy where you have individuals with magical properties. And then, of course, you have those not so nice creatures that wish to consume those magical properties, which is not very nice yeah. at all. No, indeed. And you have what's really cool about this story in particular, and I think you get like a major shout out for this, Adam, is that you have like the focus on brother relationships as well as like, which is just so cool to see because you don't always get to see that a lot amidst all of the like magical badassery that you also have in your book. So just like, just a big thank you, a huge, huge thank, thank you. you. And Adam is in conversation with Cassandra Clare, which many of you also know for her books. Wait, let me let me give you the formal, the formal introduction for both of them. <clears throat> Adam Silvera is the New York Times bestselling author of More Happy Than Not, History Is All You Left Me, They Both Die at the End, Infinity Sun, as well as Infinity Reaper, and What If It's Us. He was named Publishers Weekly Flying Start for his debut. Adam was born and raised in the Bronx. He was a bookseller, shout out to bookseller awesomeness oh, before shifting to children's publishing and has worked at a literary development company and a creative writing website for teens and is a book reviewer for children's and young adult novels, which you can tell because you always have like the best book recommendations as well as when I like it. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, and but most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, he is tall for no reason. And then we have Cassandra Clare, who is the author of the New York Times, US Today, Wall Street Journal, and Publishers Weekly bestselling Shadow Hunter Chronicles. She is also the co author of the best selling fantasy series Magisterium with Holly Black. And the Shadow Hunter Chronicles have been adapted as both a major motion picture and television series. So now that we have the formal introductions out of the way, we are going to get in the fun conversation between Adam and do you prefer Cassandra or Cassie? Cassie's fine. Okay, sweet. And Cassie. And before I relinquish total control to them, everybody knows to ye old right hand side, we have our lovely chat section. If you look down below, you will see where it does indeed say, as Ivana White, ask a question. That is where you can ask a question for our authors. Make sure you take advantage of that button. They are at your mercy. And it's also what makes events super, super fun. And then also, if you would like more books, the best way to get more books is to buy books. So if you would like to support this new book, please click that buy or sign, buy a signed book below. English is a hard language sometimes to speak. <laughs> yes. And you can get a signed, not a signed book plate. No, a signed book indeed. And on that note, Adam, I will let you take it away and I will see you guys at the end. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank That's you so much good. to Mysterious Galaxy for hosting us. And we are also celebrating the release of Chain, and, Chain of Iron, which is the second book in the Last Hours trilogy. Which and we also have the same release week, which is awesome. This past Tuesday, yes, we are like pub day siblings. And uh, so congratulations to you as well. And uh, I'm so happy that we get to kind of wrap up sort of week one of these events um, uh, together and just like kind of chatting about our fantasy world. And for those who don't know, this conversation is going to be so much about like what goes into building a fantasy series in a lot of ways it's going to be me picking cassie's brain on like how she has managed to create this like entire shadow hunters universe which has like just as many if not more books than like the marvel universe has like <laughs> movies <laughs> um and there's like a whole company like behind those marvel movies and like keeping things together so i'm so excited to learn more about the um the shadow hunters uh, squad that is like keeping things running smoothly over there. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to chat with you about your world. Um, there's interesting overlaps where our work is has some touch points. The set in you know 
the first series I wrote was set in New York. Yours yeah. is set in New York. Um, there, I have a you know a large amount of different magical creatures doing different things. You've got celestials and halo knights and yeah. uh, blood alchemists and all sorts of exciting yeah. stuff, all doing different things and having different powers. So I think you know there there are a lot of points of commonality that we can talk about. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it, it really is such a special conversation for me um, right now because as like Cassie knows and as like some people who know if you've read like a single interview of mine in the past um, that like a lot of my origin story with like sort of like moving into writing queer characters like comes from reading City of Bones which was of course like the first book the premiere of the Shadowhunters universe and um, and you know like I remember reading the cal uh, the character Alec and I've always said that I like I don't know how but I had 19 years old I had a gay vibe from him <laughs> and I didn't know that I was like like projecting or whatever um, and then to like see that on the page and then to watch the sort of romance develop between him and Magnus this like awesome bisexual warlock who we all know and love and he's iconic and is like the definition of iconic and um, and you know like I am such a slow reader like I am I like between ADD and just like not being like a fast reader in general like it's so impressive and speaks so much to my love for that romance um, that I read the entire trilogy like within a week, you know. And these are not also, they're not short books, books. <laughs> no. Um, and there's like a lot happening, and you know your your feels are demolished a lot as well. And I, um, but it really meant that much to me. And I just remember also thinking that it was just gonna be a trilogy at that point like that's how far back I went with this series you know that it was like just a trilogy right so I'm, I'm so um curious like uh, as like sort of just like kickoff like were you aware that it was going to be able to expand into like what it is today or when you were first writing the story like did you just have sort of a trilogy in mind well not what it is today which is yeah. like you know very big and sprawling and complicated but i knew i wanted to do more than three books it's just three books you know i would nobody knew who i was and this was my yeah. first book ever you know um not in a time you know and i sold it in 2005 so not in a time when ya was particularly even a big thing yeah so i couldn't sell more than three books you know i was lucky yeah. that somebody wanted to do all three of them and i really wanted that commitment to do the three because i'd heard so many stories about you know right. like publishers picking up a book and being like if it does well we'll do the next two and then that never happening and so you know i really wanted to make sure you know we were going to get to all three books and uh, you know right around the time that i was working on uh, the third book was when i you know kind of came, approached them with the idea of doing the next three um so yeah. i always wanted to kind of get there but you know i didn't know if i was going to be able to yeah i mean did you at what point did you start thinking about different time periods because you've done prequels and stuff like that like when did that sort of start floating into the process for you um i was working on city of ashes actually and okay. i was in london doing pro promo and i was really excited to be there yeah. you know oh my god i've been brought overseas to do promotion this is so exciting right. i love london uh, and uh, i was just i was walking around london it was foggy and i was crossing blackfriars bridge and i had this sudden like mental image of like these two p like people in edwardian like victorian sorry i'm doing edwardian now yeah. <laughs> uh victorian clothes like on the bridge and like in the fog there are these sort of like big metallic monsters kind of coming at them they haven't seen them yet and i was like yeah. Ooh, and you know, you sometimes, I mean, we all sort of like spark off of different things, but sometimes you see something or you have an, Im an image in your head or a mood or even or an aesthetic and you're like, what is that? And you keep poking at it, yeah. you know, until it becomes a story. And so I had the idea for the Infernal Devices, I, like pretty early on, you know, and, and I approached my editor being like, I want to write more Shadowhunter books. And they were like, oh, great, more, you know, Clary and Jason, Magnus and Alec. And I was like, well, Magnus will be in it, but it's set in, you know, 1878. Right. Like, oh, that's crazy. And they like, <laughs> people, YA, they don't read historical. Right. And, like, and but, here's the thing. I don't read historical. <laughs> like, like when, <laughs> when people ask, I'm, I'm always like curious, like I ask authors, like what genre like will you like never write? I'm like, Mm -hmm. I'm never writing historical. Like, that's my answer. It's like, for me, if I write historical, it's like. That you don't want to do, you're just not interested. The what? Is it the research that fills you with horror? Uh, or are you research. just like, like, yeah. I'm 100% going to write like 
yeah, so then I whipped out my iPhone um, in like the 1800s, you know, because I'm just like, ah, like someone will catch it, you know, and I'm like, I, I can't, and I know that like, historian readers are like, so particular, they're like, this didn't exist yet, you know, and it's like, this, this took another like, 18 months or whatever, I'm like, bro, like, that's pretty close, you know, <laughs> like, can you like, give me a pass on this? Or like, is that really worth like, deducting? <laughs> two stars on Goodreads because I invented, uh, I invented lanterns like 18 months ahead of time, you know? Um, so I just, I just can't bring that stress into my life. Cassie. I just like, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm like, I'm already nervous about doing something in the nineties because like the time I was born, cause I'm sure I'm going to like get something wrong about pagers, you know? And I just, I can't, it's too stressful. Right. When did people exactly acquire the ability to text each other? Kind of right. Stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, everybody in, in City of Bones has a flip phone because that, you know, they had flip, you know, that was it, that we didn't have smartphones. And so right. I, get, like, I get emails from people being like, why does Alec have such a stupid phone? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what, what's available? Yeah, because you don't have like timestamps in your novels either, right? Like, no, I mean, there's not, they're not spec. it's not specified like exactly when they're taking place, but yeah. you know, when I wrote City of Bones, and I think we all, we all often kind of do this, it's taking place in present day. Right. And your present day is always going to be marked out by, you know, what what what's available to you in the present. You know, yeah. I didn't know that there would ever be phones that you didn't flip to use. In fact, the first person I know who got an iPhone was Scott Westerfeld, is also a Y author. Oh and he was like, I bought this phone. It was seven hundred dollars. And I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're a thousand dollars. And I was like, what's a phone? Why would you spend that much money on a phone? God, it's it's so <laughs> crazy. Yeah. And I mean, that's such an interesting thing as well, because, you know, when writing the Infinity Psycho series or whatever, like, you know, I had to make a choice from book one, like, am I including pop culture references? Like, even though my world is not our world necessarily, because I mean, like the Shadowhunters universe is like, all that business is like hidden, you know, um, from like the open fan is what I would call open fantasy as opposed to closed fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, but do I still want to like bring that in and just do I want to give Taylor Swift powers? Do I, um, <laughs> how do I talk about like existing fantasy books and everything? How do you talk about portal fiction when magic exists already, you know? Um, so it's like all these different questions that's erased for myself and then ultimately deciding like, Oh, I'm like, I don't want to, like date my books either, you know? And I have some books that are exploding with pop culture references, you know? So it's definitely their conscious choices, but I think for like this tone, um, I chose not to, and, and I regret in some ways, like, cause I remember so much loving, especially about the original trilogy, like all of Simon's shirts and like, you know, nods to Buffy and everything. Like I would love to have been as open about Buffy as, um, or as open about like the show Charmed and Supernatural as you like were with Buffy, you know, like those were like Charmed and Supernatural were like my shows growing right. up. Right, we have those especially. formative shows, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, but those are definitely like choices you make and I guess like with historical fantasy, um, you're not like getting trapped in the same devices, I guess, but. Well, I, think, I mean, you were talking about like what you would never write and I always thought I would never write open fantasy because really? I- you to make all these decisions yeah. about like right does taylor swift have powers i mean opposed to the power she obviously currently has in our world right <laughs> and <laughs> um but like yeah like you have to make those decisions about everything uh, you know like uh you, you have to decide on a on a point in, I mean, you don't have to, but you often have to decide on a point in history like has it always been that everybody knows about magic or was there a point in history where our history split from the history of this book and right. i mean as in like true blood we know you know you were given the moment where everybody finds out about vampires yeah. you know um or is this are you creating an open fantasy world where people have always known about magic and magical creatures in which case you have to reimagine the entire yeah. path of you know the, the all of world history like was queen victoria a vampire Right. And I was just yeah. like, I never want to deal with that. So I actually admire that that you did. It's interesting yeah. that that where we think, oh no, I don't want to do that. No, and it, it's I, I I love the open world fantasy stuff so much too. And I if I learned like a misstep from it, it's that you know, for me, the magic has like always existed in the world. So my characters, like, especially when I'm in like first person perspectives, like it is their interior narrative that I am like most protective of. I am not like 
putting myself always at service to the reader. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not gonna, you know, if Emil and Brighton, the main characters are thinking about Celestials or whatever, they've always grown up with Celestials. They're not gonna stop and just randomly think four paragraphs about Celestials in service to the reader, right? Um, and- Right, you have to figure out how to intro. And, and I've had that a little because in the first two series I wrote, I dealt with, you know, people who weren't Shadowhunters coming into the world of Shadowhunters so we exactly. could learn with them what yeah. Shadowhunters were. And then by the time I was writing The Dark Artifices, Emma, the main character, is a Shadowhunter. She's always been a Shadowhunter. So yeah. the question was how, right, exactly the same thing. Like, how do you create this? You know, how do you impart the information to the reader in a manner in which, you know, it's it fe feels organic and it isn't like Emma thought about the laws and rules that governed her world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, that. and I'm so careful that because I know that it's like one of my like um, peeves in reading, you know, mm -hmm. like and not even just like fantasy, like across the board, you know, where I'm like, OK, I am like being spoon fed something that does not feel true to the character's like original line of thought. It feels like the character is like freeze frame, um, backstory, 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 and then, and play, you know? Um, and I'm yes. like, no, like there had to have been a way that this could have been organically introduced to the reader while it still remains true for where the characters are at. Did not work for a lot of people with Infinity Sun, that approach. So mm -hmm. with Infinity Reaper, I was like, cool, Sorry. you guys, you want more backstory? You want more freeze frames? I will give you some freeze <laughs> frames. Like, all good. Um, well, I like the way Emil and Brighton about, they, you know, they've always been, you know, fascinated with the idea of being celestials and in the manner that kids want to be superheroes, except, you know, in their world, yeah. superheroes are real. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that was me. Like, I was absolutely that kid who, my, my brother, he's two years older. Like, he always wants to be the hero. I always want to be the villain. And uh, so, like, he would design his own heroes then I would create like the counter antagonist and everything. And that was like our vibe, you know, and it was like so fun. Uh, but yeah, it definitely was like a good lesson. I, and in some ways I wish that I had had um, done the closed world fantasy so that Emil and Brighton could have been fed those, those details like organically, um, you know, but I really love being able to do magic in a world of YouTube and Instagram and like watching how social media so fun. Yeah, exactly. Like, with that. You have to kind of, you know, keep the Shadowhunters cordoned off from the regular world, you know, and, and it is, there is always the question, not just of like, what would date the books, but also what would they be likely to know, given yeah. that they're sort of separated off from mundane culture. So I did like the way that you're, you're able to, you know, I like reading open fantasy. I'm just scared of doing it. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. I, but I do really like the way that you're able to integrate, you know, things like, you know, technology, like YouTube, like social media into yeah. the fantasy world. I, also, I think it comes from X-Men being one of my earliest inspirations as well. Like, I was a big X-Men fan growing up, like Saturday morning cartoons especially. And, you know, like, I love that everyone knows about mutants. And, and then we get to see mutants sort of like the injustices sort of falling upon them as well. And also knowing that I wanted to kind of explore the same things um, in a political respect to yeah. the Infinity Cycle universe and everything. So yeah, I mean, another, I mean, I have loved so many characters for years, like across the years too. And I, I am curious, like, were you ever sort of like at a point where you're like, cause you, you do have like a cast of characters like per book. Did you ever sort of wrestle with how many characters you should include because that was something that I went through. I was like, is it one narrator? Is it two? Is it four? It's four. Um, but like I was scratching people out. Like, did you ever consider at one point for City of Bones, like I'm just gonna do Clary? Um, or did everyone was everyone else always there? I think everyone else was there or came into everyone that came into being that I recall pretty much got included. But there are definitely in later series there were characters that I cut out or cut down on because it's unwieldy to have so many characters and like coming up with characters has never been my problem. Right. You know, I have like I have an enormous amount of characters in my head that get, get generated, but like, yeah, definitely. I remember, and, and, and I tend to be, I tend to share a lot with my readers online, kind of talk about the process and talk about, you know, the books, even, you know, before they're published. So I remember when the Dark Artifices came out, they were like, weren't there nine Blackthorns? I was like, no, there are seven. <laughs> yeah, there were nine. I got rid of two of them. They don't yeah. exist anymore. 
Yes. And like, you know, it, it you have to make those decisions. I mean, I actually wanted to ask you about that because I you know we briefly touched on the the dreaded continuity error, which happens to yes. everyone. I try to comfort myself that apparently Thackeray submitted over 280 continuity error corrections for Vanity Fair until his publisher stopped taking them. Oh my God. I know it makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. Right. So it's it's an interesting thing, I think, because there's that the tension sometimes of of what you have either what has gone before or what you have told your readers is coming and then what you realize the story needs so yeah. i'm kind of curious about how you deal with that yeah because i i'm much like you where i am open about sharing a lot of these things on social media as well like uh you know i'm just like i'm like oh my god i just wrote this like new um love interest or whatever and then it's my first time meeting a love interest and i'm like oh they have zero chemistry <laughs> and I don't think this person's love interest anymore. So I'm like, but what do I do? I've told people this exists. And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to not worry about what I told 20 people online. And I'm going to be in my story and live in that space because that's where it's actually going to live on. Like, you're not going to like turn the page and find my Instagram story. You know, like you're going to find like the next page in the book. And that's what I have to honor. And I mean, I'm not, you know, going back and changing anything that's already there, but right. it, it is, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I am curious how you manage to stay on track with like making sure that you have so much continuity, especially when you have a character like Magnus, who is like, has just been like, for so long and have so much stuff Yeah, I mean, has, has lived so many lives, you know, um, and has like engaged with so many of your protagonists across different series and different timelines. And, um, but then beyond that, like even just in a contained trilogy, it can be really difficult to just make sure that a person's eye color didn't change, <laughs> you know? Um, so like how have you gone about that process in this like expansive world of yours? I mean, even when I first started, you know, I kept all my continuity notes in my notes about characters and history and like, a, you know, one of those files could labeled miscellaneous or something, the worst thing you could possibly do. And over time, I started as the world expanded out, especially once I had, you know, like a prequel. And then I think this was really like, so the Bane Chronicles is a series of yeah. short stories about Magnus Bane and it touches on all these different periods in his life. And it was right around then that I was like this method I have of keeping notes is not sufficient, you know, yeah. because I was working with co-writers too, and they needed to like be able to access all this info. So even though they'd read the books, it's not the same as memorizing every single detail. And so I created like a Bible, like a story, you know, like, you know how TV shows have a story Bible. Yeah. And they'll have all the details about the characters and the backstory and magic and weapons and history and how everything works. So I tried to create that, like went through all the books, color coded everything. Oh my God. And then trans, you know, like, so yeah, character details were yellow and history was green and, you know, magic was blue. And then try to transfer all that over into this sort of like store searchable story Bible thing. So, you know, that, it, that is what I do. And I'm curious how you keep everything straight. In, yeah. You know, I mean, in your fantasy I just... world. I just have um, a Scrivener doc that has all my info. Um, so it has, because I, I can't write in Scrivener, like my brain just doesn't process it that way. But That's I write you keep your notes in Scrivener? Yeah, so I have an entire world building doc on Scrivener where I also keep my chapter by chapter outlines. Um, so I have the Infinity Sun outline, Infinity Reaper outline, the Infinity, I almost just spoiled the title, the Infinity Three um, outline, <laughs> um, and, <laughs> uh, which I like just started working through as well. And, but li literally I have it broken into like characters, magic, backstory, um, secondary characters, and just like everything that I have like pretty much have included from them. Um, uh, no, someone's asking me to spoil the title. I know, I saw it. <laughs> also, guys, I love Emile and Ness. That's not what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> I, I was talking about characters of romance that you won't be rooting for because I'm like to you're reassuring them. Never reassure people. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, maybe I am talking about Emile and Ness. See, I'm taking tips. Um, and but yeah, so I really right now I just have the, the Scrivener doc that I turn to for everything, but also I'm not organized. I it's not as if I have like jotted down everyone's like changing eye colors or whatever. I, there have been no errors with that because of the magical copy editors on this series. Um, but um, I'm so grateful for that. But like, I still can't, uh, that must be such a daunting task for whoever is like 
keeping oh my my poor copy editor yeah i mean yeah. i they do their own story bible over at simon and schuster with all the you know details they, and stuff in it and they do often you know absolutely copy editors are your sort of last line of defense in a lot of cases yeah. but no um I'm, I'm gonna i'm interested to see how long you can hold out without like a yeah. like a story bible type thing because you have a very complicated world you know yeah. and I, I think for me it's um i'm so i'm grateful to hear that because everything feels so natural to me because this story has been with me for like the better part of a decade you know um so this didn't just sort of like i mean it's been in it was born in like different incarnations it was like a dark fairy tale for like middle grade readers at one point then it was also like an adult novel um at an when i was younger i don't it's so funny that like the older i've gotten the like the younger the category has like gotten but like because when i was like 18 or 19 i was writing an adult fantasy series and i was writing about heterosexual protagonists because i hadn't mm. been exposed to city of bones yet and i didn't realize oh wait a minute we can be gay in fantasy it's not just like coming out stories which again i wasn't reading i i was a fantasy fan i wasn't reading and i also like wasn't i was so closeted so i wasn't trying to be seen going into the you know then coded like gay or lgbt wasn't fully inclusive yet um like sections at like barnes and noble or other bookstores and such like that so because if you're seen reading that it's like oh why do you have an interest in that um and i've already given up enough gay vibes to people that like that's like the last thing they needed to sort of like just like nail that hammer in but you know and then being able to read queer characters in fantasy felt it was such a safe space you know um granted i felt a little gay carrying around like the city of bones original cover <laughs> just like, you know jason so shirtless and just you know um yeah I was, I, was, I was pretty excited to move into but then i'm reading like city of ashes and i'm like that was a girl on the cover and i and i feel like i look gay because of that so you know city of glass was like the perfect yeah, city of glass cover. you have like a dude with some arrows so exactly just, like, you know. that, that was what i needed um to like keep my life <laughs> territory uh, yeah, I love that so much, and and again, really, truly, like, love these covers. Um, for I love them too. I was yeah. telling Adam I get to pick the models for the covers and help with the design. So, how involved yeah. are you with your cover design? Yeah, and just so you guys know, I have volunteered uh, my services to help Cassie pick hot guys for future covers. So, yes, um, and I pointed out that my that my friends, including Holly Back, are useless at picking out hot guys. <laughs> I don't know why they're terrible at it. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, you know, I'm happy to take the bullet, but I wouldn't mind back. <laughs> well, I'm happy to take the bullet too. Um, yeah, I've been thankfully really lucky to be involved with all the covers. Um, and, uh, thanks to Aaron Fitzsimmons at HarperCollins. You know, at the very beginning, um, they approached me like, what do you want? Like, this is your big queer fantasy series that you've been wanting to do. Like, are you seeing people on the cover? Are you seeing a symbol? At first I was like, yes, they're all on the cover. Um, and here's how I pictured it. And then we hired an artist and it was not the right tone like it, it um and then i just started thinking like okay like you've got to be careful when um for the reasons i was stating too uh when publishing for like queer readers as well with like what they're able to like safely be seen reading you know like i can be safely seen reading this i can oh, be safely seen reading you know and and it's like cool you're like yeah this looks masculine as fuck you know but like i um so like that's wonderful but i wanted to because you know three of my four narrators are queer in the infinity cycle um and then i just like i wanted like trick straight people you know and i'm like yeah there's a straight guy who's gonna be reading this book like oh yeah that that bird looks like mortal Kombat, like cool whatever i'm gonna go buy it and then like boom page two he's gay you bought it though like uh now read it and see if you can like um, be tolerant um and and you know because i've had that experience i've had i've had readers tell me over the years that a book of mine may have been like the first time reading about a queer character and while they don't necessarily still understand like the gay thing they're not like disgusted by it anymore and i know that it's such a weird low um, bar yeah and i'm like but i'm so grateful for it especially when it comes from a teenager because i just have such mm -hmm. high hopes that like they're going to break free and emerge as like a totally like liberal awesome person <laughs> um so right. So and again, I've, I've definitely had those interactions and it's interesting now because 10 years later, really almost 15 years later, I'm starting yeah. to get emails from the people who read City of Bones and, you know, and wrote to me about it all that time ago. Yeah. So I'm getting dates on their lives and it's just 
fantastic. I I got an email the other day from a girl who was like, you know, hey, you know, here's our, our email correspondence from 10 years ago. I pasted it below. Oh my and I know it was really weird. And she was like, I wrote to you because I was like upset that Magnus was bisexual. And you kind of explained to me that he was bisexual and what that yeah. meant. And, uh, you know, she was like, and I'm bisexual. So this is great. You know, oh I'm just, I know she's like, I'm really happy that I had that. And it helped me like sort of figure out, you know, myself. Yeah, and that's such so a sweet. always the best. Yeah. Yeah. And th I mean, that's incredibly special. Also, props to you for being so patient. I would have been like, Throwing I, I read the email and I was like, gosh, I was like, I was very stern and I felt bad about it. But I was just yeah. like, no, okay, you know, she was like, don't you think it'd be better if Magnus was straight? And I was like, I do not. No. I'm going to explain to you why. No, and I'm I wouldn't be calling Magnus an icon. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It, no, you I like, mean, exactly. I mean, you know, you would just, you'd be just be an emo kid with, you know. Yeah. Which like, cool. Him, so. No, uh, I was but just, not exactly like. I don't know, nothing groundbreaking. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, I know, I think it's a really important, you know, part of it's part of his personality. This is part of who he is. This is his part of his identity. This is Magnus. If you like Magnus, then you also like this about him. Yeah. You're not you like him despite this. You like him because of it. No, and, um, and it truly is. It's one of the reasons I'm just so grateful to, to see um, just Magnus and Alec, like, be the primary protagonist, like, of their story. Because, I mean, first of all, they were always so well centered and dimensional even as like secondary characters you know but to like see them be like the faces of the beautiful faces <laughs> i'm gonna keep holding up these covers <laughs> um, uh, of, of their um their own series is just so satisfying and uh um and appreciative and i just yeah i like i'm i'm so happy that like i i like i just know that i would have been so consumed by these books as well like 10 years ago as i'm able to be today and uh and i just appreciate the work that you have like because look you have put diversity in your books before we were having conversations about diversifying our works you know like i remember even diversity feeling like such a strange word to me who me a white passing puerto rican gay, like gay puerto rican um who grew up in the south bronx you know because like i grew up like where I was like the whitest person on my blog, you know? Um, so like, I was genuinely confused in 2014, 2015 to discover that there were places in our country that were just white. And I was like, that like that was truly like groundbreaking news to me, um, you know, like, and, and helped me sort of like gain the scope on diversity. And this really has me appreciative of so many authors who were so um, inclusive of us before feeling almost like a pressure uh, to be more reflective of our existing world today. Right before those conversations really being had, or it was part of the discourse. I mean, I know yeah. what you, I think it, it's interesting because, you know, I knew I, I was never going to write a coming out story because I don't know how to write contemporary fiction at all. I don't understand realism. I don't understand yeah. realism. <laughs> like, like, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> I yeah. like reading it. Again, a thing I love reading, don't know how to do myself. But I had a, you know, really close friend when we when I was a teenager and he was gay and he was like, I never see people like me in, in the books that I like, you know, yes. handed books that have, you know, that are like, you know, coming out stories and, oh, you know, OK, but like a I mean, he definitely talked about like, there's no way you're going to look at this book and not know what it's about. And that's right. a problem with his parents and you know somebody gives him you know i can't even remember the books that were published back then but like if somebody hands you annie on my mind you know what it's about you know from the cover yeah and it's a valuable book and it's wonderful that it exists but it can be a problem for kids to bring that home if they have not come out to their parents and also he just wanted to read about like magic and dragons you know yeah. and, like there's nothing and like he's like there's nobody like me in those books so i mean that was definitely that was the impetus for creating alec i was like well there should be, you know, these big, this big group of, you know, demon killing, you know, monster fighting, cool, awesome, badass assassins. And one of them is gay. And he's yeah, you know, not what his story is about. It's no, about I, I, I love that. who I, falls in love with a hot warlock. I mean, you know, a hundred percent, which I mean, like, can that be my reality? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> a hot warlock with like centuries of stories. Like, I just like, there's such a moment that I still think about, and I hope I'm even remembering it correctly. And if maybe, uh, I hope that you even know what I'm talking about. If not, we'll get one of your continuity editors to come yeah. back to me. But like, um, like, I just remember this moment, I think it was in City of Ashes with Alec with the key, like hidden inside his shirt. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, 
I just, and I remember it was like before things were like super public for Alec and Magnus and everything, but there was just this like really sweet moment where it's like, oh, he has a key um, to like, I, maybe it was like Magnus's place or something. Yeah, um, yeah he's got yeah. a key to get into the apartment. Yeah, and I was just like- yeah, and, and Magnus had been dating and he hasn't been telling people that they're dating, but Magnus gave him a key to the apartment anyway. Yeah, and I like- Which is nice, look. I didn't think Alec was gonna steal a stereo or anything. God, and I, it's, <laughs> I'm like, which also like, I love the hit a key when it's like, just like, just kick that shit in, you know? But no, but I mean, look, I read that when I was 19 and I'm 30 now. And I like, I can still recall, like, do I have all the details? No, but like, I remember the feeling of experiencing that moment, you know, as like a closeted 19 year old who came out later that year, you know? And I, I do honestly like, a, like, credit you in the series to um as like a factor to that because it put me on this like on this road of like oh wow no i'm like actually like seen here and i get to exist in the spaces that i am most in love with like i want to fight the dragons i want to slay the vampires i want to cast the spells you know like i want to shoot the arrows i want to kiss the hot warlock you know, um, and that's an incredibly special feeling that I like, which also then inspired me to when I came out, then I was like more comfortable reading contemporary stories uh, about like queer people and everything, which of course just like broadened my view, my worldview as well. So I do think there's something really beautiful about being able to have that be the portal for a lot of people in fantasy, <laughs> um, that they're able to sort of like come back to the real world um, with like heightened empathy um and yeah i think it's right i think it's important to kind of acknowledge the significance of being seen in a book because i remember so the story holly told me it's not something that happened to me but she was in a writing group and um there was and someone else in the writing group was talking about you may know these books the mercedes lackey books they have that have queer protagonists right and so he said you know um and I genuinely can't remember them because I only remember the series title, the Arrows of the Queen. But uh, there, so somebody in the group was like, oh, those books are stupid. They're badly written. And somebody else was like, those books saved my life. Yeah. And I'm like, you have to keep in mind, like, just the importance of feeling seen. And, and they were certainly written at a time where they're, I remember reading them and being like, oh, this is so, you know, like, this is the only, like, one of the few times I have seen a gay character in fantasy. I was so yeah. excited to find them and like share them with my friends and like it really is and and you know I remember also the feeling of be of disinclusion like when I read the Narnia Chronicles and I got to the end of the books I was like oh as a Jew apparently I am not welcome in Narnia right I die outside Narnia that's pretty right. explicit yeah. and you have the feeling of like I'm not here like I'm explicitly not here yeah. no you're it's not just that you're here you're banned yeah like, I banned from Narnia I was like <laughs> yeah it's really mad yeah. and I was like a kid I didn't and like you know I just and I was mad but I also felt hurt you know yeah, no that's gutting you know <laughs> uh like I mean that is just that it's so deliberate you know um and it's what has been so heartbreaking about you know like JK Rowling's comments um about the trans community right where it's just like wow like you are straight up like no like there's no trans kids in Hogwarts there, there are no trans kids at Hogwarts you're never gonna get your Hogwarts letter yeah, like that's like it's just so screwed, and I'm like it's so disappointing, and um, like it really, I'm just like I'm still like in shock, like over. I'm like, oh, you know, like it, that. Um, oh, such it was a so shade of humanity. Yeah, it, it, it came, and I, I understand from people who pay more attention than I do that they're that I guess she had said things before, but it came for me. It came out of nowhere. Yeah, so it I'm, wasn't boom, and really you're like, oh, this is really i mean what i thought was this is so hurtful for all of these trans kids who value these books or the p and the, the people who aren't kids even but who grew up with these books and yeah. what is this like for them like i remember that moment of like being shut out of narnia and this must be such a similar feeling yeah it, i mean for me it's like you know like it, like the key moment that i just described right like for so many trans readers like they whatever their equivalent is inside the harry potter universe you know um, they had that moment for themselves, you know, they had that moment that like, is not just a random Deathly Hollow. I have a Harry Potter tattoo, like this, this was, oh, movie, man. you know, That's um, feeling. yeah. And it, and it's just like, and there are so many like trans readers who have Harry Potter tattoos and know more trivia than I ever will, you know, and it's like heartbreaking to just like see them like cast out that way. And, and, you know, and I guess like to that note too, cause I know like as 
the deeper that your worlds go too, like I know that you even have like progressed with even more inclusion as well. Like how do you go about sort of crafting those characters um, in this sort of like day and age? Um, I think that, you know, when you're writing outside in your own experience, you want to do as much research as you can and you want to do the kind of research that involves talking to people for whom that is their life experience. So for instance, for Diana, who is a character in The Dark Artifices, she is a trans woman. And so I contacted, uh, unfortunately for me, one of my best friends is a doctor and one of their good friends runs the trans clinic at the hospital near where I live. So I contacted oh, them. But yeah. explain what it was that I was doing. And I was like, I, I know this is, you know, this is an ask and nobody nobody owes me this conversation. So anybody's interested or anybody like, you know, is a fan of writing or a fan of fantasy, would they like to, you know, is there a trans woman who would like to talk to me about what they would like to see in a trans character, what they think is important to mention, what they would not like to see, what stereotype they would like to avoid. And many really wonderful women contacted me. And I was, it was pretty funny. I was... Um, so I would, I would, I, I wanted to, you know, meet them in a in a, co in a coffee shop so that they would feel safe and not like right. I was, you know, who was trying to get people to come to my house. But yeah. I didn't know me. And so I kept going to the same coffee shop over and over, and I would meet, you know, these different women, and we would talk, and they would talk to me about their lives, and it was just, they were so amazing, they were so helpful, they didn't have to be, and uh, you know, it was, and it was, it was really great. But like I had probably met like fifteen ladies at this coffee shop, so the next time that I went in, the guy behind the counter was like you date a lot of women. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, he looks like this really shitty girlfriend who can't <laughs> be all these different Tinder dates in this coffee shop. <laughs> Never the same person twice. Field, you know? that's, 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 I, know. I was like, I don't know how to explain, so I'm just not going to say anything. I No, like, let, let that be, like, the story that he takes home to his, like, family and friends, <laughs> you know? I And I, I love that, too, what you said about... Um, going like directly to the person and asking like what they want to see instead of it even being like, here's what my idea is um, about like what I think you should look like in a fantasy world. Like, will you sign off on that? You know, like I, I, I love that so much. And I actually, I, I think that's such important framing, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, cause I'm, I'm very much the same way where I'm like, I, unless I have someone like clearly like in my life who like represents a certain identity, like I don't necessarily always feel comfortable like giving them like prominent stage um like in my in my novels because i like i need to know your like i need to be familiar with you at like all levels your joy your pain like your struggles and everything um uh, to feel equipped to be able to like write about that and like so i know there's like definitely like there's more diversity that i want in my novels as well um and i definitely have a long way to go and i hope to be able to continue to do this for a long enough time that i'll be able to kind of like hit all the marks that i i hope to um even though I know I'm sure that you will I don't have any concerns about that Thank I'm you. actually really excited that you have moved into fantasy as you've moved closer to me yes <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna keep doing it all um <laughs> I, I I have one last question and then I'm gonna like try to we'll do a couple lightning rounds um <laughs> but um I'm curious like so we've inserted a glossary into Infinity Reaper and the paperback of Infinity Sun just because you know again like like my world building backstory like wasn't there enough of people that like and there was a lot of characters and a lot of things to keep track of that I was like cool I'm gonna create a glossary is there you don't have glossaries in your novels do you no I'm very cruel I don't yeah like what's the glossary what's the, in my novels I, I'm working on a, I don't know I'm working on a high fantasy novel right now yeah. um it's fun and and totally different than doing contemporary and that's um, and I, hmm? is that the adult I, one Yes, it's adult. Okay. It's called Swordcatcher. Yes, and uh, it's but it 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 is the first time that I've been like maybe I'm going to need to have a glossary because damn you know I've made up countries, made up cities, made up yeah. languages, and I can't expect everybody to remember all of that. Um, and it's true, yeah. maybe I'm being very cruel with uh, the John Waters books. <laughs> I know, but it's also like, how do you, how do you even just start to introduce it now? You know, like this. Know, right? it's, it's, but I mean, you've got celestials and what, what do we got? Here? Spectres, bloodcasters, halo knights. I mean, it's yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I think that I need to. It's totally up to the author to include the glossary, include the. Oh, you know what I like? I like a map. I love a fantasy map. Yeah. Getting a fantasy map for my high fantasy, and I'm so excited. Nice. But like, <laughs> oh yeah, because you, you haven't. Have you had maps in any? Of no, because it just takes place in the. It takes place in our world. Right. I mean, there's a little map of like Alicante, the, the you know the Shadow Hunter. Yeah, the magical. Um, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. home country city um in one yeah. of the books but otherwise it basically takes place in our world so there's right. no need for that um but I feel in, like they could have still done a map on like yeah so like here in saint mark's place underneath it or like hidden there's this and so you know like it, they did do that for they've done that for the historical so there is a map like okay. that's just sort of it's a map of London and then superimposed onto it, there are like the places that are important, you know, oh, like various cute. characters. This is Matthew's house. This is Thomas's house, you know, like kind of thing. So we, we do get that, which is kind of fun. But, you know, having your high fantasy map is that. Like, yeah, I grew up reading, you know, Tolkien and all of my other, my dad's other yeah. weird fantasy books that he collected. And so a lot of sword and sorcery, a lot of, yeah. lot of dudes carrying ladies around <laughs> while I, wearing leather. Yeah, <laughs> for the maps. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do like quick lightning rounds before we move into the last little bit um, where I'm going to, there's going to be opportunities to win uh, a copy of Cassie's books. You can choose from any book in the Shadowhunters world. Um, and you can also win a, a 10 minute meet and greet with me. Um, mm -hmm. So we will get to that in a second. Um, okay. If characters, this is from Trevin. Hey Trevin. Um, if characters from your books could date characters in the other person's book, who would date who? I feel like, obviously I want like a meal with Alec or Magnus. Um, and I, I I feel like I can see, okay, I can see Emil with Magnus and Ness, our shapeshifter, with Alec. <laughs> um, like, I feel like they have similar vibes or maybe like we just go crazy and do like Ness and our shapeshifter with Magnus, the warlock, <laughs> um, and just like let that magical baby <laughs> um, hit the streets like I, I don't know I'd be into well, that. someone's shipping ne Ness and Alec in the comments I find that okay, cool. a very a very angsty but hot pairing I see it I see it all right um <laughs> let's see uh where's Taz Taz is in daycare he says hi um uh let's see who would the Infinity Reaper characters be if they were in the Shadowhunters universe um okay that's interesting I I I guess like Emil would be a shadow hunter, um, like a resistant shadow hunter. Um, but like, what about Brighton? Bright, yeah. I'm. I feel like Brighton wants to be a shadow hunter. Like Infinity Sun, Brighton would want to be a shadow hunter. You know, but like he's like not gonna like have not be equipped for it just yet. Um, what I like about Brighton is his is his desire is his, his love. I'm trying to not be spoilery. Yeah. Love a big move. That is a guy who makes a big move. Yeah, not always a good idea, but I love that in a character. Chaotic. I think Brighton would be a vampire. I think he would like walk mm -hmm. into a vampire's nest and be like, <laughs> you know, immediately. Like, oh, <laughs> he's like, no, I want powers. Like, let's do this. Yeah, I, that that's well, right. right. You know what? If you are a mundane, you're right. The best way to get power quickly is to go get yourself turned into a vampire yeah i just remember that like that all the business with like simon um and the yeah. trilogy and it's just like ah um yeah so i think yeah i think i think that's where brighton would end up um he's he's getting powers um and uh, if you're not making him a shadow hunter cool he's gonna go um handle that himself yeah he's just like i'm i'm gonna go get bitten be a super vampire yeah. um i love this one from mysterious galaxy uh, uh what creature from your books would you want to be and is it the same one you think you'd actually be? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, which character? Wait, which character? Oh, in which, your... which creature? Oh, which creature? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would like to be a celestial. Yeah. I might end up. I mean, I would never be cool or coordinated enough to be a Halo Knight. That would not. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a thing I could achieve. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I would like to be a celestial, but could possibly be uh, tricked or into becoming a bloodcaster. Cool. Yeah, I, could, be like, How I, this happened? I could see that. What, what power as a celestial would you think you would have? Like telekinesis, flying? Um, I don't like teleportation. Can I, do, can, I be, can I be a teleporter? I don't know if that's oh, a yeah. Teleport, okay. yeah. Yeah, I'd like, like I really hate airplanes. I'd really like to be able to teleport myself various places. I, so you, I, if you had to be a, like a downworlder, which one would you be? Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I can pull off the vampire thing. There's just something kind of like Edward Cullen-y about me. Um, and uh, and I'm just like, 
I, I was it um was it Raphael the the young yeah yeah Raphael Puerto Rican the, yeah yeah um I just remember like all the Spanish and everything too and just like and and really like appreciating that um and so yeah I think I would like I want to okay but was it Daywalker or Daylighter uh, Daylighter Simon daylighter. became a Daylighter after yeah. biting I want to be a Daylighter um, yeah because yeah, yeah, you don't want to just be around at night right interesting yeah, things no. during like, the day. I, yeah, I, I need to like walk my dog. So I gotta, uh, <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's that. Um, oh, okay, sure. this was so fun. Um, guys, we're gonna go break into this thing. I love the comment, Brighton is slutty for vampires. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Brighton would be Valentine's minion just for power. That is aggressively true. <laughs> awesome. Um, but then he might kill Valentine and take his place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically guys, the way we do this um, to, I'm going to be choosing uh, two people. You're going to be guessing numbers in the comments. Um, Cassie, I'm actually going to give you the chance to um, get put together numbers between like, like with like, like a 20 number range or 40 number range. So like one to 40, 80 to one point, you know, um, you could choose what those numbers are. And then I'm going to write down the numbers, the two numbers I'm thinking of in that, in that window. Um, mm -hmm. And then the first two people who come up with those numbers, um as you guys can see a blank sheet of paper here um will win the the books and the meeting greet so you decide the 40 number window okay you so you mean like between like 20 and 60 yeah okay, okay. you want to do 20 and 60 yes okay. <laughs> i'm very bad at math <laughs> okay i've written the numbers um all right, so now you guys just guess in the comments. Uh, Ooh. Okay, uh, Janine, you have one with 24 um, proof. And okay, now, oh God, now I need to. All right, this you guys have 10 quickly. seconds to put in your numbers. Um, and then I need you guys to stop so I can scroll through. <laughs> uh, one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Nine, ten pencils down. Muchas gracias. All right. Si mi gente say. Um, all right. So we are scrolling for this second number. Second number. Second number. Second number is always the one that takes the longest. Um, and sometimes we have to go again. Oh, someone was painfully close. I'm so sorry. Um, as was another person. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, everyone is like just missing it. This is uh oh, mysterious galaxy has come in. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. Uh, okay, oh Freya, you got it 56. Um, Woo! so what you're gonna do is you're gonna email assistant at adamsilvera.com. Um, and my assistant Caitlin will um be in contact with you for your addresses so I can send you um, whichever Shadow Hunter novel universe you would like, and we're gonna buy from Mysterious Galaxy as a thank you to uh, for hosting us today. Okay. And I think that's our event. Thank you all so much um, for uh, hanging out with us. Cassie, thank you so much for all your valuable insights. Um, thank I'm... you for chatting with me and um, for doing that table read thing that I made you do. That was really Oh, yeah. Fun. That was so fun. <laughs> yeah. It was a nice opportunity to connect with people during. Uh... It was. It's nice to see, to see other people during the. Yeah. during the pandemic since I usually, you know, only see my husband and that's it. Yeah. So, but thank you again for including me in that. And thank you again for my boys. Um, I'm so glad you liked all those curses. I loved writing it. It was super fun. It's not over yet. And I merely have to decide which of our sexy guys is going to be on the cover of book three, but you can help me when that day comes. Oh my God, please. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> thank you. I feel like we would all get into trouble if we went to like a romance book convention where they have the models who do all the covers just walking no, around. I've, I've been to the romance novel convention. Oh. It is kind of amazing. Is there are all these like, you know, basically naked dudes rocking around and they come up to you and they're like, vote for me because they usually have like a competition for the hottest. <laughs> hot <guy. laughs> That's not hot. Megan's not hot. Don't ask me to vote for you, and then I might vote for you. Right. Play hard to get, oh, you know. 
just right. Yeah. You don't want to just give away your vote immediately. You want to be like, well, I don't know. I mean, you are dressed like an ancient Egyptian, but there is that guy over there who has that, angel wings. So I have a lot of angel. Yeah, thinking of an angel too. <laughs> Well, can you turn into an animal? What's your power? You got to say. I met a weir bear oh, at yeah. a convention. I mean, he did not, in fact, in front of me, turn into a bear, but said he was a bear. We'll take we'll take his word for it. Wait, I think he was just trying to get my vote. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole. Thank you, Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you, Adam. It was wonderful to talk about your wonderful books. Yeah. And, uh, happy book birthday. You as well. Thank you. Yes. All right. So happy book birthday to our amazing authors. Thank you so, so very much, Cassie. So very much, Adam. Everyone, go out and buy their books so you can get even more in the series. That was very enthusiastic because I am passionate about that. And there is the buy signed book button down below. You are slowly being hypnotized by the book movements to click the button. And thank you so much for joining us. This was such a pleasure for the two winners. Make sure, Adam, will you give a shout out for the email address for them one more time in case yes. they missed it? It is just assistant singular at adamsilvera.com. Assistant at adamsilvera.com. Um, and her name awesome. is Caitlin, if you want to greet her like a human being like she is. So, yeah. Which I would highly recommend. So yes. thank you guys so much. Make sure you email them. Good night, everyone, and we will All see right. you on Good night. the next thank one. You. Good night.